In fact, it's been around, well, as long as we have. The ancient Greeks, for example, were the first to develop the idea that nature obeys a set of laws. This is a tremendous breakthrough. They gave us notions about how the universe works and about the way things move. Trouble was, most of these notions were dead wrong. That's because the laws of physics sometimes seem to defy common sense, like our first great discovery. For some 2,000 years, it was believed that heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects. This conventional bit of wisdom was based on observations made by the Greek philosopher Aristotle. And people believed him because it seemed like common sense. But in the 17th century, Galileo Galilei decided to test Aristotle's law. Legend has it that his test involved dropping balls of different masses from atop the Leaning Tower of Pisa. To see Galileo's experiment in action, I paid a visit to the NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, and met with Steve Simons, project manager for microgravity research. So this is the chamber. Yes, this is uh, the vacuum chamber. It goes uh, 400 feet into the ground, and we have to pump all the air out of that so that we can get a good microgravity drop. Now this, this goes back a long way, right, to Aristotle. Aristotle, yes it does, where Aristotle thought that objects with different masses would fall at different rates. Which seems reasonable. It seemed very reasonable because all of the um, history that people had with objects of different masses falling at different rates. For example, if you have a feather and a ping pong ball, both fairly light objects, but they will fall at different rates. Oh, yes. To illustrate the difference between two objects that are roughly the same size and shape, but obviously very different masses, is a golf ball and a ping pong ball. And if we drop those, they do drop at the same rate. Through Galileo's experiment, he found that a heavier object seems to fall faster than a lighter one because of air resistance. Air resistance slows a lighter object more than a heavier one. The other way we do it is if we shield the experiment, which we can simulate with this leaf, from the effects of air, then they will drop at the same rate. So what are we doing here? Well, we're in our uh, five-second zero-gravity facility, and we overcome the air resistance in this facility by pumping all of the air out of this uh, huge vacuum tank. We've got an experiment set up here today to check out new fire extinguishers for possible use on the International Space Station. So we're going to see if helium is a better fire extinguisher than carbon dioxide. Anita, if you would, please. So she's going to drop the big vehicle down. And there it goes. goes. Five seconds in it. <laughs> and you can feel the floor yeah. shake when the, when the drop vehicle hits. <laughs> Hey, Bill, let me take you down to the uh, bottom of the vacuum chamber. We can retrieve the experiment and see what happened. What fun. Galileo's challenge to Aristotle's law was a turning point in science. It marked the beginning of testing the accepted laws of science through experimentation. And Galileo's experiments with falling bodies led to our earliest understanding of acceleration caused by gravity. A force, nearly 400 years later, we would overcome. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully, they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? How about that? proves that Mr. Galileo was correct. We owe our next great discovery to Sir Isaac Newton, who was born in England the same year that Galileo died. Legend has it that Newton was relaxing in an orchard one day when he saw an apple fall from a tree. This simple incident caused him to wonder 
why the apple had fallen to earth while the pale August moon continued to sail contentedly overhead. It was a eureka moment of insight for the young man. He realized that the same gravitational force acted on the apple and moon alike. If you think about it, you get the feeling that all through this apple orchard, there's some force that's pulling the apples down. And what was really great about it was that he extended it beyond the apple orchard and all the way out to the moon. He realized that this force was everywhere, and this was something that nobody had really thought about before. Newton reasoned that as the moon tries to travel in a straight line in space past the Earth, the Earth's gravitational force pulls the moon towards it. This keeps the moon trapped in orbit around the Earth. But the moon pulls on the Earth too, with its own gravitational force. Newton had discovered what is called the law of universal gravitation. Universal because the relationship applies to all bodies in the cosmos, including apples, moons, and planets. When the gravitational force of a large body, like the moon, acts upon the Earth, big things can happen, such as the ebb and flow of the Earth's oceans. The water in the ocean that's near the moon feels a greater pull than the water that's on the other side of the Earth, far from the moon. So it gets pulled out a little bit. And then as the Earth rotates, there's this kind of bulge in the water. And as the Earth rotates against it, it gets higher water and lower water. Newton's recognition that all objects have their own gravitational force was a landmark discovery in science. But as our next discovery shows, he was far from finished. To many people, Sir Isaac Newton is physics, and it's largely because of a series of three books he wrote which contain Newton's second great discovery, The Laws of Motion. The laws explain the movement of all physical objects. To help understand the three laws of motion, consider ice hockey. It's simple enough. You hit a hockey puck and it just keeps sliding off across the ice. You can see that on a frictionless surface, it'll just pretty much keep going indefinitely. When you hit your stick against the puck, it accelerates it. And the nature of that acceleration that gets it from being standing still up to speed is explained by the second law, or rather you can calculate it using the second law. The third law says that when you hit the puck with the stick, uh, the stick gets the force equal and opposite to the puck, or to put it another way, if one of the hockey players punches the other one in the face, he's as likely to break his knuckles as the other guy's jaw. Newton's laws of motion were a bold insight into the mechanics of how the universe works. They established the foundation of what is now known as classical physics. This is the science of thermodynamics in action. The science of heat transformed into mechanical energy. The power-driven machinery of the Industrial Revolution depended on it. Heat energy can be turned into the energy of motion, such as by turning a crank or a piston or a turbine to be used to pump water, to turn a loom to make fabric, to move a boat through the water, to move a train down rails. Now it's desirable to get more oomph for your dollar to get more work done for the amount of fuel you're going to use. And so people began to study how heat engines, how steam engines really work. Among those who studied it was a German scientist named Rudolf Clausius, who in 1865 formulated our next great discovery, what became known as the second law of thermodynamics. The law states that in any energy exchange, such as heating the water in a steam engine boiler, some energy is always wasted. Clausius coined the word entropy to explain why the efficiency of a steam engine is limited. Because some of its energy will always be lost in the process of converting it to mechanical work. It was a momentous insight, one that changed our understanding of how energy works. There's no heat engine that is 100% efficient. 